On the morning of March 24, 2003, Melinda McGee, a 31-year-old licensed practical nurse, finished working the night shift at an Alabama nursing home. After getting home at around 8.30 a.m., Melinda called her husband, Troy, who was at work. Before getting off the phone, Melinda said that she was going to sleep until Troy and their kids returned home later that day. When Troy and the kids arrived home at around 3.45 p.m., Melinda wasn't there. Instead, they found signs of a violent struggle, including blood, inside the house. Officers quickly arrived at the scene and concluded that Melinda had been assaulted and abducted. It's been just over 20 years since Melinda disappeared, and investigators are still searching for the person responsible. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. Each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you use. All right. So this week's investigation that we're going to be diving into, Melinda McGee, uh, this one is, it's an interesting one because this is another disappearance. Many years have passed and yet we really don't know what happened to Melinda and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance are mysterious to say the least. I'm not going to get into the facts right now. We're going to go through it throughout this episode. There has been a couple potential suspects linked to her disappearance. One was a serial killer. And there was also some, some details uh, made later by investigators, by law enforcement that suggested they had other suspects on the radar. And one of them specifically uh, has not been cooperative with police uh, throughout this entire investigation. And the big question there is, who is this person? So we're going to dive into that tonight. We have a lot to cover. So without further ado, let's get into this week's case. Born on June 3rd, 1971, Melinda Wall grew up in Escambia County, Alabama, which is located on the Florida border. Unfortunately, not much is known about her early years, but we do know that Melinda was sweet, bubbly, and kind, and she had a close relationship with her family. In or around 1996, Melinda married Troy McGee, who had a son from a previous relationship. They later welcomed two boys together and settled in a rural area outside Atmore, a small town in Escambia County. Their home was at the end of Kent Road, which was a dead-end dirt road with only three houses on it. Now, a quick footnote here because I don't really think it has much weight, but I wanted to at least point it out. Uh, the McGee home was sort of near I-65, which some of you may know. It was a serial killer along that stretch, and he was recently identified in, I believe, in April of 2022. There's not a lot of articles out there that connect uh, Melinda's disappearance to this serial killer, but again, you never know, so I wanted to put it out there if that's something you wanted to research further. But before you go too far down that rabbit hole, just a heads up, I did look into it a little bit. It was Harry Edward Greenwell, that's the name of the serial killer, and his MO appeared to be connected to women where he would assault and kill them along hotels near I-65. So not a direct match doesn't mean he, you know, Melinda couldn't be an outlier, but that's what I was able to find. Now, while raising their sons, Tony worked at Maslin Carpets in Atmore, while Melinda worked as a licensed practical nurse at nearby prisons and a nursing home. In the early 2000s, Melissa also began attending school to become a registered nurse. By the spring of 2003, she was just months away from graduating. And by all accounts, Melinda and Troy were still happily married and even had plans for a weekend trip to the beach, but they never made it. On the night of March 23rd, Melinda worked a 12-hour shift at the nursing home. At around 7 a.m. on what is now the 24th, she finished her shift and headed to the local convenience store. This was the last time she was ever seen alive. At around an hour later, Melinda arrived back at home 
At that time, Troy was already at work. Melinda and Troy's two sons were with a babysitter, and Troy's son from a previous relationship was at a dentist appointment. This meant Melinda was home alone all by herself. At approximately 8.30 a.m., Melinda called her mom, something she always did after working a night shift. She also called Troy at work to discuss who would pick up the children from the babysitter. Troy offered to do it so that she could get some more rest, and Melinda happily took him up on the offer. Before ending the call, Melinda mentioned that she was going to sleep soon. After this, no one ever heard from her again. Later in the afternoon, Troy finished work and picked up all three of his sons. They returned home at around 3.45 p.m. According to the Atmore Advance, when they got out of the car, one of Melinda's sons rushed ahead of everyone to wake up his mom, but she wasn't inside. The son ran back outside to tell his dad what was going on. When Troy went inside, he found signs of a struggle including blood, but no sign of Melinda. Troy obviously grew very concerned and called Melinda's mother, Weta. He told her about the blood in Melinda's absence and asked if she knew where Melinda might be. Weta had no idea, but due to the blood, she suggested Troy check the hospitals to see if Melinda had gone there. The Atmore Advance reported that Melinda had varicose veins, which led Weta to theorize that maybe one of Melinda's veins had burst, forcing her to seek help at the hospital. Troy contacted all local hospitals, but none had any reports of Melinda being there. So at 3.59 p.m., he called 911 to report his wife missing. The Escambia County Sheriff's Office responded to the scene and discovered blood and signs of struggle, but quote, no evidence of a homicide. They examined Melinda's car, which was parked near the house and noticed that her keys were locked inside. According to Melinda's sister, Amanda, this was not unusual because Melinda occasionally locked her keys in the car accidentally. What did strike everyone as unusual was that Melinda's purse and cell phone were left inside the house. It seemed odd because these were things that Melinda would have taken if she left the house willingly. After carefully reviewing all the evidence, detectives determined that someone had attacked and abducted Melinda. Following this realization, the Escambia County Sheriff's Office, the Alabama Bureau of Investigation, and nearly a dozen other local agencies joined forces to investigate and search for Melinda. Now I want to stop real quick and address the elephant in the room because I'm sure some of you at this point are saying, hey, what about Troy? Was he ever investigated? Could he have been a suspect? And, and the question is, I'm sure he was considered, uh, and we don't have anything 100%, but from the research that was conducted, it appears that Troy was vetted, and I feel pretty confident in saying that his alibi was confirmed, that he was at work all day. There would have been other people there to confirm this. And the only thing that raises a little bit of an eyebrow is that, you know, when he never gave any quotes to the media, and, the, and you know, Melinda's family never mentioned him when they gave their statements, but that doesn't necessarily mean he was involved. And honestly, the fact that he never spoke to the media doesn't carry really anything with me. He, he wants to get stuff out there, but he might understand also that because he's her husband, he's going to be looked at by certain people as a potential suspect. And it's better for him just to not say anything at all. As far as where I am on the whole situation, I'm going to assume and, and, and also hope that he was vetted thoroughly and that his statements were corroborated and it was confirmed that he was in fact at work all day when he said he was there uh, and everything kind of matched up and he was ruled out very quickly. So that's where I am on it. I just wanted to make sure I give you the full picture because I'm sure some people would be asking about it, uh, especially in the comments down below. Now, while multiple agencies investigated Melinda's disappearance, her family and friends put up missing person posters throughout town. Then on March 29th, Authorities and hundreds of volunteers conducted a search within a 40-mile radius around the McGee home. Unfortunately, they did not find any clues. As the investigation continued, detectives noticed possible similarities between Melinda's disappearance and a series of homicides committed by, at the time, an unidentified serial killer from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, located around 250 miles from Atmore. According to the Associated Press, Authorities believe the serial killer had been responsible for the murders of five victims dating back to September of 2001, with four of the murders beginning in the victims' homes. After Escambia County detectives learned about the serial killer, they started to investigate whether Melinda might have been one of his victims. In mid-April, an Escambia County Sheriff's detective met with members of a multi-agency homicide task force investigating the serial killer to review all cases and search for similarities. Within a month of this meeting, the serial killer was actually identified through DNA testing as Derek Todd Lee. He was arrested and eventually linked to a total of seven murders that occurred between 1998 and 2003. 
However, according to AL.com, investigators were not able to connect Derek to Melinda's disappearance. Escambia County detectives were back to square one. By September 24th, Melinda had been missing for six months. Her family was trying their best to hold it together while facing the reality of the situation. Melinda was likely dead or not coming home. Her sister Amanda expressed her frustration to the Atmore Advance saying, quote, I'm angry. Angry that there are no answers. Angry that whoever did this took away our right to bury her. And we don't have anybody to blame. Amanda said the family discussed Melinda's case daily, trying to find ways to help, including reaching out to America's Most Wanted and seeking help from private investigators. They were doing everything they could think of to keep her case in the public eye and obtain justice. Amanda also dispelled various rumors circulating around town, including claims that Melinda had been stalked prior to her disappearance. Amanda emphasized that she and Melinda were very close and she would have known if there was a stalker. All right, so I have to stop in and wait here, and, and by no means is this meant to be disrespectful to Amanda or question her beliefs. But from experience in this field, I think the, the term stalker is a spectrum, right? There's really severe cases where the individual is sitting outside of the home of the victim, is calling them, is, is hitting them up on social media all the time, following them to work, etc. It's a really overt case. But I do think there are lower levels of a stalker where they may be just someone who attempts to run into them when they can, who may drive by the house once in a while, who may call and hang up every now and then. Um, and you have to go back to Melinda's occupation. I wrote it down when I first read this, this story. She worked at the prison and in nursing homes. And I don't know what type of characters she was dealing with at the prison. Was it low level? Was it high level? Did some of the individuals that she interacted with get out of prison at some point in time? Um, did they have a crush on her while they were in prison? And then when they got out, they kept tabs on her without her knowing. These are all real possibilities. And this could have been a situation where let's say she was working in the prison and then one of the prisoners after they get out happens to run into her or see her at a local convenience store earlier that day, right? And says, oh, that's the nurse that used to take care of me. I really liked her. I had a crush on her. I wonder if she lives close to here. And unbeknownst to her, they follow from a safe distance behind her down to this dead end street. As I said earlier, there's only three houses in total on the street. So you could park over there without anybody really knowing she goes into her house, the assailant waits a little bit, and then goes into the home afterwards. And, you know, if she's someone who is absent-minded occasionally, and we know that to be true from her family members, she locked her keys in the car multiple times, is it also possible that after walking in the home, she forgot to lock her door behind her? I think it's a very plausible scenario. So it could have been a very easy situation for this quote-unquote stalker um, to gain entry to the house and have an element of surprise. So just to kind of wrap this up, what I would say to Amanda is yes, it, there probably wasn't a long-term stalker who had been writing her notes, going by her home, her place of work, which again, I agree with you. She would have noticed that and she would have made you aware of it. It could be a situation where this individual had feelings for her while she was working at the prison or the nursing home, never mentioned it to her, never showed any signs of it was able to suppress it to a certain degree, then sees her that morning at the convenience store and all those feelings and urges comes rushing back and at that point he decides to act on it. Now, Escambia County Sheriff Grover Smith also spoke to the Atmore Advance stating, quote, anyone who knows something or thinks you know something, no matter how trivial, that may be the clue we are looking for. The community has stood behind the family and we ask that if you have questions or information, call law enforcement, not the family. We ask that you spare them that. I want to echo what the sheriff said right there because I've, I've slammed it into your guys' brains numerous times. Regardless of how small the information is that you have, no matter how trivial you think it might be, if you know anything, make sure you relay that to law enforcement because, as I've always said, that little piece that you have may connect multiple larger pieces. And there's no way of you knowing that because you don't have access to the entire investigation to all of their police reports. And if you do decide to give information but are a little weary about it, don't opt to give it to family members because it could get lost in translation. And you don't want to bring them into the investigation if you don't have to. 
If you're going to say something, make sure you call the people in charge of investigating the case because, again, they have all the pieces. The family members do not, and it may actually hurt the case if you tell them over actual detectives who can do something with it. Now, at this stage, detectives will work tirelessly on the case, frequently meeting with agencies from different counties, the Alabama Bureau of Investigation, and the FBI. These agencies would review the case and make suggestions for tactics that the Escambia County Sheriff's Office could employ. The Sheriff's Office implemented every single suggestion they received. And a quick kudos to them for that, because I've said this also before, sometimes a lot of egos get involved with this. And when a sheriff's department gets a, or a local police agency gets a big case, this is what they've been waiting for. And they don't want to admit that maybe the case is bigger than their department can handle. And they're less apt to take suggestions from outside agencies because they feel like it makes them look weak or like they're incapable of doing their job. The reality is there are certain agencies like the FBI who work cases like this every day. So when you have an opportunity to use not only their resources, but also their experience, you as an investigator, regardless of how many cases you've worked, would be foolish not to take their advice and at least hear them out. You have to remember, regardless of how good you are, there's always someone out there who's better or who who's experienced a case that may be similar to the one you're working. And whenever you want the best chances of solving an investigation, it's important to have different opinions of, of people who have different backgrounds in the room so that you can hear them all out and develop the best plan possible for that particular investigation. So kudos to them for being open to it. Kudos to them for involving other people that may be able to assist in solving this case. In addition to getting other agencies involved, multiple labs thoroughly examined all evidence gathered in the case. The Alabama State Lab checked it first, then the FBI re-examined it to ensure no leads were overlooked. And I will say if they developed any new information from this process, it has not been shared publicly. As the one year anniversary in March of 2004 approached, Belinda was still missing. To mark the difficult milestone, Belinda's family organized a candlelight vigil. According to the Atmore Advance, Melinda's sister, Amanda, told the crowd that the family had lost hope for her safe return. She said, quote, it would take a miracle. We can only assume she's dead. We're just asking for people to pray. Amanda added, quote, the past 12 months have been a blur. We're still waiting on tomorrow. We're still hurting. It's an ache. It's a void. It's there 24 hours a day. Amanda acknowledged that law enforcement remained dedicated to the case, but the lack of new leads had led to frustration within the family, and for some, it had turned to anger. She said, quote, My father's angry. He's so upset that there's a murderer out there, and the police don't have anything. Amanda followed up that statement by saying she knew that law enforcement was doing their best. She explained, quote, I guess we get the misconception from TV and think there are answers coming. I've been doing research, and from what I know, answers could take years. So unfortunately, Amanda's right here. These cases can take a very long time and, and movies and TV have created this misconception that law enforcement has access to these computers and this, this technology where regardless of how difficult the case is, they can solve it in a week. And that's just not the reality. Yes, we have situations where the information is obvious and there's a major slip up which identifies the suspect almost immediately and there's an arrest, and then the family can start to grieve and heal. Um, but that's not always the, the situation. Sometimes it's going to take not only efforts from law enforcement, but also participation from the community. And sometimes that participation doesn't come right away. It can take weeks, it can take months, it can take years. And I will say this, sometimes it never comes. And that's the actual reality of criminal investigations. Now, as a detective, we don't go into it with that mindset. Every case we take on, we go into it with the plan of solving it. But we also understand that that solve may not come overnight. It's going to take weeks, months, and potentially years of hard work to get the resolution that you're looking for. And understandably, that's very hard for the family of the victims to understand and accept. And I, you know what? As, as a human being, I don't blame them. Now, Sheriff Smith assured the Atmore Advance that the case remained a top priority for his department. He said he had recently convinced the FBI to open a case file on Melinda's disappearance, which he saw as a positive step. 
He expressed frustration at not having new information to provide to the family, but said he remained hopeful that the FBI's involvement would break open the case. But unfortunately, the FBI was not able to solve the case either, and the investigation continued. In October of 2004, Escambia County detectives learned about Jeremy Brian Jones, who had been charged with murdering a 44-year-old woman in Mobile, Alabama, located around 50 miles from Atmore. Detectives thought there could be a possible connection between this murder and the disappearance of Belinda, so they started looking into Jeremy. Sheriff Smith told the Atmore Advance that his department did consider Jeremy a suspect in Melinda's disappearance, but only because the nature of the murder in Mobile aligned with the details they gathered in Melinda's case. Smith made it very clear that they didn't have any direct evidence linking Jeremy to Escambia County or to Melinda. They were just, quote, closely examining him like they would any other suspect in a case that shared similarities. A few weeks later, the Associated Press reported that Jeremy had officially been ruled out as a suspect. Detectives had obtained records and witness statements confirming that Jeremy was working in Georgia at the time of Melinda's disappearance. At the beginning of 2006, the Escambia County Sheriff's Office brought on an experienced cold case detective named Tommy Calhoun to re-examine Melinda's case. Under Calhoun's direction, the investigation seemed to be heating up over the next few years. In early 2008, the Escambia County Sheriff's Office conducted multiple interviews with an unnamed individual. During these discussions, detectives were told that Melinda's body might be located in a septic tank behind a burned-down house on Jack Road. In February, a team consisting of local officers, detectives, and FBI agents searched the area. They used the backhoe to excavate two septic tanks, one old and one new, which were both emptied. Unfortunately, Melinda's body was not found, and there was no evidence that suggested she had ever been there. In January of 2009, the Escambia County Sheriff's Office received another tip, this time suggesting that Melinda's body might have been buried in a rock quarry behind Judson Cemetery, which is located off Jack Springs Road. Authorities from both Escambia and Baldwin County, along with the FBI, conducted a search of the quarry using cadaver dogs and sonar equipment. However, like the previous leads, this search did not provide any new evidence. In March, law enforcement searched an area near Perry Lane, which is close to the Alabama-Florida state line, but once again, nothing was found. After this search, the investigation really seemed to slow down. And in March of 2010, seven years had passed since Melinda's disappearance, which was the duration of time required by the state of Alabama to declare someone deceased. Because Melinda was presumed dead by authorities, her family went ahead and obtained a death certificate. One family member told the Atmore Advance, quote, that doesn't mean the case is closed. Melinda's case is still open. By March of 2013, a full decade had gone by since Melinda was likely assaulted and abducted from her home. Escambia County Sheriff Smith held a press conference to mark this anniversary. He assured everyone that detectives were still working on the case, which he said was now officially considered a homicide investigation. Sheriff Smith said, quote, this has never been a cold case that has been shut up and put in a filing cabinet. This has been on someone's desk for 10 years. It is an active investigation. He also mentioned that detectives were currently re-interviewing individuals they had spoken to previously, gathering new leads and witnesses, and quote, drilling down very deep into the case. During the conference, Sheriff Smith also shared a message from Melinda's abductor and likely murderer, quote, we also want to remind the person who took Melinda McGee that every time you hear a footstep behind you, every time you hear a noise in the night, it could be us. We're not going to quit. We are never going to let you rest. Sheriff Smith expressed doubt that the abductor would be found locally, saying, quote, The type of person that will commit a crime like this is likely to commit another similar crime in 10 years. That has not happened here. Now, I want to weigh in on this. I, I like Sheriff Smith. I like his enthusiasm. I really like that quote that I just read. But I think sometimes as investigators, we can get caught up in historical data and tradition and, and typical MOs. You could be right, Sheriff Smith. This could be a serial killer who maybe Melinda was their first victim. Maybe that was she was someone in between. But I also think without any specific information, and maybe he does have something, we haven't seen it if he does, that this could be a one-off. As I said earlier, this could be a situation where you have an individual who had a fascination with Melinda from previous encounters, whether it was at the prison or at the nursing home or even just from the community, 
And on this particular day, based on circumstances beyond our comprehension, knew that she would be home alone and decided to act on it. And that's, this person could be, this person could be a neighbor for all we know. So could they be found locally? I would push back and say, absolutely. Um, in fact, I would say based on how rural of an area this was, it, it, this is more than likely someone who previously knew Melinda, although I will concede the fact that this could have also been someone who was passing through that particular morning and saw her at the convenience store or saw her while driving and decided to follow her. My only apprehension and hesitation with that is, is how would that person, if they didn't have any previous knowledge or intelligence about Melinda and her background and her family makeup, how would they know that on that particular day she would be home alone? You can answer that question. You, you got to start your career in law enforcement. Now, following the press conference, lead detective Tommy Calhoun spoke to the media. He mentioned that his team was looking into more than one person in connection with the case. However, he didn't reveal any details about these suspects. He explained, quote, people remain suspects until they can be cleared. And there are several individuals we are highly interested in that we will not clear until we have sufficient evidence and information that they are no longer a suspect. Calhoun went on to say that some of these individuals have refused to cooperate with the investigation for the past decade. Now, I don't want to look too deep into this, and I always tell you we got to read between the lines. I'm a little stumped here. What does this mean? The past decade? That means that this person has almost been on the radar uh, the entire time. And that would make me believe that this would be an individual who had some type of dealings with Melinda. I would hope as this investigation was conducted, um, there were individuals that she worked with or that she had interactions with as a nurse um, who were vetted as well or who were considered suspects initially and then talked to afterwards. So I don't know who these people could be. As far as why he's saying this, I think he's trying to put it out there to those individuals like, hey, you know who you are. We're not going away. And Maybe this is like a passive threat where eventually their names might come out. I don't know. I don't know what the intention was here. I think the only person who would know that would be Calhoun and the rest of his team. Now, following the conference, Melinda's family released a statement thanking law enforcement for their continued efforts. They said, quote, our family still fights a daily battle. We want to express our appreciation to all law enforcement that has worked on her case. We continue to hope for closure and ask that anyone with information call law enforcement, no matter how small you think it may be. A few weeks later, Melinda's sister Lisa sat down for an exclusive interview with NorthEscambia.com. She revealed that from the moment she learned the details of Melinda's disappearance, she never had hope of finding her sister alive. Lisa stated, quote, I live every day with no hope that she will be found alive. I knew from the first day. I knew and believed at that moment that she had been murdered. Lisa went on to say that now all she can hope for is to find Melinda's remains and the person responsible for her murder. When asked what she would say to this person, Lisa replied, quote, I don't want him to know the pain, the hurt, the anger I felt. He is not worthy of any of my words. Sheriff Smith also shared his thoughts with NorthEscambia.com. He admitted that Melinda's disappearance continued to trouble him, saying, quote, we're all a little concerned when we lay our head down and sleep to know that a person can be abducted from their home in broad daylight and 10 years later, we still have no answers. For the next six years, there were a few updates in Melinda's case. Then in January of 2019, Sheriff Grover Smith concluded his 16-year run as Sheriff of Escambia County. He told the Atmore Advance that out of his 46 years in law enforcement, two cases weighed heavily on his mind, with one of them being Melinda's disappearance. He said, quote, I think about that case every day. I hate going home with it still unsolved. Now, this is something that is really profound and really impactful because you think about an officer with almost 50 years on the job, still thinking about Melinda's case. And this is something that's, I feel, missed by the public. As I always say, as an investigator, you want to stay objective and unbiased. You don't want to take these cases personal, but we're human beings. We're fathers, we're mothers, we're sisters, we're brothers. And so it's hard not to find similarities to not only the victims, but their families. 
and you put yourself in those positions and what you would do to solve the case if it was someone you loved and cared about. And it's really hard not to take those emotions, those feelings home with you every day. And I can tell you right now that there's a ton of detectives out there, some of who are still on the job and some of who have retired, who that when they go home, they don't think about the cases they solved. They think about the ones they didn't. Now, it's important to note that even with the new sheriff taking over, Tommy Calhoun stayed on the case as lead detective. And in March of 2020, Melinda's family spoke with NorthEscambia.com to mark the 17th anniversary of Melinda's disappearance. Her mother, Wita, said, quote, Our lives will never be the same. The pain and loss is just as painful today as it was that day. Melinda's sister, Amanda, said, quote, The selfishness and meanness of the person that committed this crime haunts us daily. Our love for Melinda is as strong as it ever was, and she is missed daily. Perseverance is our only weapon along with prayer. Melinda's sister Melissa added, quote, We continue to pray that Melinda's body will be found and we can lay her to rest as she should have been years ago. We are hopeful that the person responsible will be found out or come forward. We also pray that whoever knows something, because someone does, will come forward in hopes of some type of closure. Nothing will ever bring Melinda back but she deserves to be found and justice needs to be served. While Melinda's family continues to speak with the media around the anniversary of her disappearance, there have been no major developments in the investigation. Melinda remains missing to this day. Okay, now for my perspective on this investigation, and I've kind of sprinkled it in throughout the episode, but I'm just going to go over it one more time. So for me, I don't necessarily think this is a person who is probably connected to many other cases. I don't think this is some serial killer. I could be wrong, but I just I just don't see it. Because of Melinda's occupation, I think it's more than likely that the person involved with her disappearance and, and mo most likely death is someone who's connected to that community. It could be someone she worked with at the prison or the nursing home, and that could be someone who was another employee at the prison or the nursing home, or it could be an inmate or a patient. Uh, this person does not have to be overt in their feelings. This could have been something that they were able to suppress and weren't really vocal about, but they may have had a fascination with Melinda while she was interacting with them, and she may have never known it. Now, it's also possible that this could have been a community member. As I said at the top of the show, this was a rural town. She lived on a dead-end street with only three houses, and I'm assuming most of the people in that community knew of each other. And if you look at the pictures of Melinda, she was a beautiful woman. It would be easy for someone from that community to see her and have fascinations about her. And this could have been someone who was very close to her family and friends or barely knew her. But either way... If it's a rural town, it wouldn't be too hard to figure out her schedule and her husband's schedule. If they were familiar with the fact that she was a nurse and she worked the night shift and that her husband worked the day shift, then this offender would know that during those hours, during the mornings, she would most likely be home alone. This would give them that window of opportunity where they would not only have the element of surprise, but they would have less people to deal with if they decided to attack her. Couple that with the fact that she lived on a, a street that wasn't very busy. This creates a, a victim of opportunity. Now, with all that being said, this could also be a situation that began and ended that day. What do I mean by that? Well, as we know, she was last seen at a convenience store. Was there someone in that convenience store, another customer, who saw her in the store or while she was walking to her car, found her attractive and just had this urge to do what they wanted to do. It may have been something that they were thinking about for weeks, months, maybe years. And it wasn't specifically about Melinda, but when she came out of that store, whatever urge they had for that day, that week, that month, that year, they had decided that uh, Melinda was going to be one of their victims. So at that point, they follow her home. They see that she goes inside. There's no other vehicles there. They could have sat on the property for a couple hours, noticed no one around the surrounding community, and decided to go inside. And 
Melinda could have already been sleeping. She could have been getting ready for bed. I will say that based on the limited information we know about the crime scene, the fact that it sounds like there was a struggle uh, leads me to believe more than likely um, she was still up and awake when her attacker entered the home. And I will say based on what we know, it does appear that she was injured at the time of the assault. My only question that I wasn't able to answer through this research is if there was blood, 2003 is not that long ago in the context of where science and technology was in 2003. Uh, I would like to think based on swabs that were collected at the crime scene, I would hope that it was confirmed that the blood found at the crime scene uh, belonged to Melinda and not anybody else. They could easily test that blood to determine if there was a familial match to her relatives or to her children. Um, that would be a top priority because one, it would confirm that she was injured during this assault. Also, it would, it would rule out the possibility that maybe some of the blood found actually belonged to Melinda's offender. So where does that leave us now? Well, what it sounds like is that investigators, the sheriff's department, are going back to square one. They're re-interviewing all the people that were initially interviewed. I would hope that would also mean that they're going through the reports again, double-checking all the work that had been done prior to this reopening, or I guess I should say reviewing, of the investigation. And they're also putting a little bit of public pressure on the people who weren't initially cooperative to maybe come forward and finally tell their side of the story. But overall, I will say this, and I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but it doesn't sound like they've honed in on anyone. It doesn't sound like they have someone in their sights. They just don't have enough to connect them to the crime at this point, which is unfortunate. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't keep going forward, which it appears that uh, investigator Calhoun and the rest of his team are, are continuing to do that. So that is hopeful. And the family members would have the most insight into the cooperation and the effort that's being put in by law enforcement. And as you could see through this episode, um, they've been nothing but complimentary of the police department, of the sheriff's department. So that is a good sign that this, this effort will continue. But like I always say, we don't want to just rely on investigators. Maybe there's something that one of you out there can do to help solve this case. So just to recap, Melinda McGee disappeared from her rural Atmore, Alabama home at some point between 8.30 a.m. and 3.45 p.m. on March 24th, 2003. Authorities believe she was assaulted abducted, and murdered. And at the time of her disappearance, Melinda was 31 years old, 5'4", 130 pounds, with brown hair and brown eyes. And if you have any information about Melinda's disappearance, please call the Escambia County Sheriff's Office at 251-867-0304. And my final words, as always, are to Melinda's family and friends. Uh, my thoughts are with you guys. And I really hope that uh, us covering this case here gives some more exposure, uh, a little bit of a boost to this investigation. Uh, and whether it does or not, I hope that you guys get the answers you deserve. And as you have said numerous times, Melinda deserves to be brought home. Her offender deserves to be brought to justice. We will be here with you to support you all the way through until that happens. For everyone else, I appreciate you guys making it to the end of the video. Way down in the comments below. Let me know what you think of this investigation. Until next time, stay safe out there and I'll see you soon.